Hello and welcome to Earth Science, Lecture 15, Composition and Structure of the Atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere is unique. No other planet in our solar system has an atmosphere with the exact mixture of gases, nor the heat and moisture conditions necessary to sustain life as we know it. The gases that make up Earth's atmosphere and the controls to which they are subject are vital to our existence. In this lecture, we will begin our examination of the ocean of air that we must all live in. We will also answer a number of basic questions, such as what is the composition of the atmosphere, where does the atmosphere end, and where does outer space begin, what causes the seasons, which will be covered in a future lecture, how is air heated, and what factors control temperature variations around the globe. Earth's atmosphere is extremely unique. And what we can see here is uh, some images of our atmosphere. This thin layer of gas supplies the oxygen that we, ble that we breathe, excuse me, shields us from har harmful ultraviolet and X-ray radiation from the sun, and it protects us from the continual bombardment of micrometeorites. It generates rain-giving clouds and traps just enough heat to keep Earth habitable. How did Earth end up with atmospheric conditions that are so favorable to life? Well, we'll explore this in the next few lectures. We'll also discuss why Earth's climate remains relatively stable and how human activity may threaten that stability. So these images are intentionally put into the slides um, for a good reason. So I'm going to give you an analogy. An average apple is about 225 millimeters around, and its skin is 3 millimeters thick. All right, so picture an apple in your hand. If we compare the Earth and its atmosphere to an apple and its skin, the skin of the apple is about 20 times thicker relative to the apple than the atmosphere is to the size of the Earth. You could also represent this air on a standard globe, so like a classroom globe, with only a layer as thick as a dollar bill. So let's take a look at some of the science behind things before we move forward. Newton's experiments provided that white light is a mix of all colors of the rainbow. Later scientists found that it is uh, light beyond, or that there is light beyond this rainbow as well. Just as there is sounds that our ears cannot hear, such as the sound of a dog whistle, there is also light that our eyes cannot see. In fact, light that we can see is only a tiny part of the complete spectrum of light, usually called the electromagnetic spectrum. Light itself is often called electromagnetic radiation. The electromagnetic spectrum is commonly divided into regions according to their wavelength, or frequency. Keep in mind that despite the differences in names, everything in this electromagnetic spectrum represents a form of light and therefore consists of photons that travel around space at the speed of light. So here you can see the different kinds of light. We, starting from the most energetic or the shortest wavelengths, we have gamma rays, then x-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, which is what we see, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. So altogether, that makes up the electromagnetic spectrum, and we will revisit this later. Weather influences our everyday activities, our jobs, and our health and comfort. Many of us pay little attention to the weather unless we are inconvenienced by it or that it adds enjoyment to our outdoors. Nevertheless, there are a few other aspects of our physical environment that affects our lives more than the phenomena that we call weather. Acted on by the combined effects of Earth's motion and the energy from the sun, our planet's formless and invisible envelope of air reacts by producing an infinite variety of weather, which in turn creates the basic pattern of global climates. Although not identical, weather and climate have much in common. Weather is constantly changing, sometimes from day to day and sometimes from hour to hour. It is a term that refers to the state of the atmosphere at any given time and place. Whereas changes in weather are continuous and sometimes seemingly erratic, it is nevertheless possible to arrive at a generalization of these variations. Such a description of aggregate weather conditions is termed climate. It is based on observations that have been accumulated over many years. Climate is often defined simply as average weather, but this is an inadequate definition. 
To more accurately portray a character of an area, variations and extremes must also be included, as well as the probabilities that such departures will take place. For example, farmers need to know the average rainfall during the growing season, and they also need to know the frequency of extreme wet and extremely dry years. Thus, climate is the sum of all statistical weather information that helps describe a place or a region. Suppose you were planning a vacation in an unfamiliar place. You would probably want to know what kind of weather to expect. Such information would help you select clothes to pack and could influence decisions you make regarding activities that you'd like to engage in during your stay. Unfortunately, weather forecasts that go beyond a few days are not dependable. Therefore, you might ask someone who is familiar with the area about what kind of weather you can expect, such as, are thunderstorms common, does it get cold at night, or are their afternoons sunny? What you are seeking is information about the climate, that is, the conditions that are typical for that place. For example, this graph on the right shows the average daily high and low temperatures for each month, with all, uh, as well as extremes for uh, New York City. It is important to realize that climate data cannot predict weather. Weather and climate are expressed in terms of some basic elements, that is, quantities or properties that are measured regularly. A change in one of these elements will often bring about changes in the others. The most important elements are air temperature, humidity, the type and amount of cloudiness, the type and amount of precipitation, air pressure, and the speed and direction of wind. These elements are the major variables from which weather patterns and climate types are deciphered, and we'll take a much closer look at most of these down the road. Sometimes the term air is used if, as if it were a specific gas, but it is not. Rather, air is a mixture of many discrete gases, each with its own physical properties in which varying quantities of tiny solid and liquid particles are suspended. The composition of air is not constant. It does vary from time to time and from place to place. However, if the water vapor, dust, and other variable components were removed from the atmosphere, we would find that its makeup is very stable worldwide up to an altitude of about 50 miles. Two gases, that is nitrogen and oxygen, make up 99% of the volume of clean, dry air. Although these gases are the most plentiful components of air and are most significant to life on Earth, they are of minor importance in affecting weather pheno phenomena. The remaining 1% of dry air is mostly the inert gas argon, which makes up 0.93%, roughly, plus tiny quantities of a number of other gases, which you can see in the top right of the figure. Carbon dioxide, although present in only minute amounts, that is 0.0405% or 405 parts per million, is nevertheless an important constituent of air. Carbon dioxide is of great interest to meteorologists because it is an effective absorber of energy emitted by the Earth, and thus it influences the heating of our atmosphere, which we'll get into very soon. Although the proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is relatively uniform, its percentage has been rising steadily for the last 200 years. The figure on the right is a graph that shows the growth of atmospheric CO2 since 1958. Much of this rise is attributed to the burning of ever-increasing quantities of fossil fuels, such as coal and oil. Some of this additional carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean or is used by plants, but at about 45% remains in the air. Estimates project that by some time in the second half of the 21st century, CO2 levels will be twice as high as the pre-industrial level. Most atmospheric scientists agree that increased carbon dioxide concentrations have contributed to warming of the Earth's atmosphere over the past several decades and will continue to do so in the decades to come. The magnitude of such temperature changes is uncertain and depends is uncertain, excuse me and depends partly on the quantities of CO2 contributed by human activities in the years ahead. The role of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and its possible effects on climate are examined later. So here is a graph of CO2 levels rising since around 1950, 
And what you'll notice is there's also this squiggle pattern. So it, it varies up and down, up and down throughout the years. Well, interestingly enough, this has to do with the seasons. So anytime it's winter, a lot of our greenery or plants uh, go away, and so they can't absorb a lot of the CO2 anymore, so we see our CO2 levels rise. But then in the spring, our plants come back, and we have a lot of photosynthesis occurring again, so it takes away some of this carbon dioxide. And then this process cycles over and over again. Air also includes many gases and particles whose quantities vary significantly in different times and places. Important examples of uh, this, these gases include water vapor, dust particles, and ozone. Although usually present in small percentages, they can have significant effects on weather and climate. You are probably familiar with the term humidity from watching weather reports on television. Humidity is a reference to water vapor in the air. The amount of water vapor in the air varies considerably, uh, from practically none all the way up to about 4% in volume. Why is such a small fraction of the atmosphere so significant? Well, the fact that water vapor is the source of all clouds and precipitation would be enough to explain its importance. However, water vapor has other roles. Like carbon dioxide, water vapor absorbs heat given off by the Earth, and some solar energy. It is therefore important when we examine the heating of our atmosphere. When water changes from one state to another, it absorbs or releases heat. This energy is termed latent heat, which means hidden heat. As we shall see later, water vapor in the atmosphere transports this latent heat from one region to another, and it is the energy source that helps drive many storms. The movements of the atmosphere are sufficient to keep a large quantity of solid and liquid particles suspended within it. Although visible dust sometimes clouds the sky, these relatively large particles are too heavy to stay in the air for very long. Many other particles and microscopic uh, objects remain suspended for considerable periods of time. They may originate from many sources, both natural and human-made, and include sea salt from breaking waves, fine soil blown into the air, smoke and soot from fires, pollen and microorganisms lifted by the wind, ash and dust from volcanic eruptions, and more. Collectively, we call these tiny particles aerosols. From a meteorological standpoint, these tiny, often invisible particles can be significant. First, many act as surfaces on which water vapor can condense, which is an important function, function in the produ production of clouds and fog. Second, aerosols can absorb, reflect, and scatter incoming solar radiation. Thus, when air pollution episode is occurring, um, or when ash fills the sky following a volcanic eruption, the amount of sunlight reaching the Earth's surface can be measurably reduced. Finally, aerosols contribute to an optical phenomenon that we have all observed, the varied hues of red and orange at sunrise and sunset. Another important component of the atmosphere is ozone, which is a form of oxygen that combines three oxygen atoms into a single molecule called O3. Ozone is not the same as oxygen that we breathe, which has only two oxygen atoms per molecule. In the, uh, excuse me, there is a very little, uh, there is very little ozone in the atmosphere, and its distribution is not uniform. It is concentrated between 6 and 31 miles above the surface in a layer called the stratosphere. In this altitude range, oxygen molecules are split into single atoms of just oxygen, O, when they absorb ultraviolet radiation emitted by the sun. Ozone is then created when a single atom of oxygen and a molecule of oxygen, O2, collide. This must happen in the presence of a third neutral molecule that acts as a catalyst, by allowing the reaction to take place without being consumed in the process. So ozone is concentrated in this 6 to 31 mile height range because a, a crucial balance exists there. The ultraviolet radiation from the sun is sufficient to produce single atoms of oxygen, and there are, are enough gas molecules to bring about the required collisions. The presence of the ozone layer in our atmosphere is crucial to those of us who dwell on Earth. 
The reason is that ozone absorbs much of the potentially harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. If ozone did not filter a great deal of ultraviolet radiation, and if the sun's UV rays reached the surface of the earth undiminished, our planet would be uninhabitable for most life as we know it. Thus, anything that reduces the amount of naturally, uh, that reduces the atmosphere's naturally occurring ozone could affect the well-being of Earth on life. Uh, excuse me, the well-being of life on Earth. Just such a problem exists and is described in the next image. Although naturally occurring, ozone in the stratosphere is critical to life. It is regarded as a pollutant uh, when produced at ground level because it can damage vegetation and can be harmful to human health. But ozone is a major component in a noxious uh, mixture, mixture of gases and particles called photochemical smog, which forms when strong sunlight triggers reactions among pollutants from car exhaust and industrial sources. So at this point, I'd like you to take a moment to watch a video on the ozone hole. Uh, so in this video, you can get a good idea on what has been going on in recent times with regard to a hole in the ozone layer over Antarctica. So please take a moment to watch that before continuing on with the lecture. To say that the atmosphere begins at, Earth, at Earth's surface and extends upward is obvious. However, where does the atmosphere end? And where does outer space begin? There is no sharp boundary. The atmosphere rapidly thins as you travel away from the Earth, until there are too few gas molecules left to detect. Collisions of individual atoms or molecules in an atmosphere create pressure that pushes in all directions, much like the air inside of a balloon. A balloon offers a good example of how pressure works in a gas. The air's molecules inside a balloon exert a pressure, pushing outward as they constantly collide with the balloon's inside surface. At the same time, outside air molecules collide with the balloon's outer surface, exerting a pressure that by itself would make the balloon collapse. A balloon stays inflated when the inward and outward pressures are balanced. This pressure holds up the atmosphere so that it does not collapse under its own weight. The higher you go in the atmosphere, the less the weight of the gas above, and thus the less weight means less pressure. To understand the vertical extent of the atmosphere, let us examine the changes in atmospheric pressure with height. Atmospheric pressure is simply the weight of the air above. At sea level, the average pressure is slightly more than 1,000 millibars. This corresponds to a weight of slightly more than 1 kilogram per square centimeter, in other words, 14.7 pounds per square inch. The pressure at higher altitudes is less. One half of the atmosphere lies below an altitude of 3.5 miles. At about 10 miles, 90% of the atmosphere has been traversed, and at about 62 miles or above, only 0.00003% of all of the gas that makes up the atmosphere remains. Even so, traces of our atmosphere extend far beyond this altitude, gradually merging with the emptiness of space. So this image here tries to make an analogy that um, the gas in our atmosphere is sort of like pillows being stacked. The further at the bottom you are, the more compact everything is, the more pressure you're experiencing. So the gases are more compact, just like the pillows. But the further up you go, the less weight there is above each particular pillow, and so they can fluff out more, or in this case our gases can expand more. And so this graph here shows you how pressure changes with height at the surface, down at the bottom, and up towards space at the top. So we'll see a high pressure of 1,000 millibars near the surface that steadily decreases as we go further and further up. By the early 20th century, much has been learned about the lower atmosphere. The upper atmosphere was partly known from indirect methods. Data from balloons and kites showed that near Earth's surface, air temperature drops with increasing height. This phenomenon is felt by anyone who has climbed a high mountain and is obvious in pictures of snow-capped mountain ranges rising above snow-free lowlands. Unlike atmospheric pressure, though, temperature varies with altitude in a fairly complex way. The way in which temperature varies with altitude determines what is often called the atmospheric structure. 
These differences result from the individual ways in which each layer is heated. The key to understanding atmospheric structure lies in the interactions between atmospheric gases and energy from the sun. So as you can see on this large image on the right, we have the structured layer of our atmosphere. We have four main layers that we're going to look at, and you'll notice the temperature zigzags back and forth as we go up. So what we're going to do is take one slide to look at each of these layers, starting from the bottom, where we live. The lowermost layer in which we live, where temperature decreases with an increasing altitude, is the troposphere. This term literally means the region where the air, quote, turns over. The temperature decreases in the troposphere and is called the environmental lapse rate. So this decrease in temperature is the environmental lapse rate. Although it, uh, its average value is 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer, or 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet, a figure known as the normal lapse rate, um, its value is variable. So what this is telling us is that, on average, temperature decreases about 3.5 degrees for every 1,000 feet you move up from the surface. The troposphere is heated only indirectly by the sun. Sunlight warms the Earth's surface, heating the lower part of the troposphere. Visible light passes through the atmosphere and warms the Earth's surface. The ground returns the energy it absorbs by radiating in the infrared. Greenhouse gases then absorb this energy and warm the troposphere. Because the infrared light comes from the surface, more is absorbed closer to the ground than at higher altitudes, which is why the temperature drops with an increase in height from the surface. So sunlight comes all the way in, as you can see on the far right. The visible light strikes the surface and leaves as infrared. But because of greenhouse gases, it's trapped here. And so at the surface, we have it being very warm. And the further away you get, the cooler it is. Uh, this vertical temperature variation causes convection currents throughout the troposphere, which gives rise to weather. The primary cause of storms is the churning of air by convection, in which warm air rises and cool air falls. Recall that convection occurs only when there is strong heating from below. In the troposphere, the heating is from the ground, which can drive the convection cells. To determine the actual environmental lapse rate, or the rate at which temperature is decreasing, as well as gather information about vertical changes in pressure, wind, and humidity, something called radiosondes are used. A radiosonde is an instrument package that is attached to a balloon and transmits data by radio as it ascends through the atmosphere. The thickness of the troposphere is not the same everywhere. It varies with latitude and seasons. But on average, the temperature drop continues all the way up to a height of about 7.4 miles. The outer boundary of the troposphere is what we call the tropopause, so the boundary at the top of this layer. After that, we reach the second layer of our atmosphere, the stratosphere. In the stratosphere, which extends from about 7.5 to 31 miles above the surface of the Earth, an appreciable amount of oxygen in the form of ozone, a molecule of three oxygens again, is existing. Ozone is very efficient at absorbing ultraviolet radiation from the sun, which means that the stratosphere can be directly absorbing solar energy. So here we can see UV rays coming in and notice that they stop when they get to the stratosphere. Most of this ultraviolet absorption and heating occurs at moderately high altitudes within the stratosphere, which is why the temperature tends to increase with altitude as we go upward from the base. So you'll see once we hit the stratosphere, temperature starts to increase as we go up. This temperature structure prevents convection in the lower stratosphere because heat cannot rise if the air above it is hotter. So convection only works down here on, in the troposphere. And this is again why the heating increases as you go up. It's because it's absorbing energy at the top from UV radiation. The lack of convection makes the air relatively stagnant and stratified or layered with layers of warm air overlaying cooler air. This stratification explains the name stratosphere. The lack of convection also means that the stratosphere has essentially no weather and no rain. Pollutants that reach the stratosphere, including the ozone-destroying chemicals known as chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, 
remain there for decades. Note that a planet can have a stratosphere only if its atmosphere contains molecules that are particularly good at absorbing ultraviolet photons. Ozone plays this role on Earth, but the lack of oxygen in the atmosphere of other worlds means that they also lack an ozone. As a result, Earth is the only planet that we know of that has a stratosphere. Continuing upward, we reach the mesosphere. Above the stratosphere lies the mesosphere. Very little ozone is found there, so ultraviolet radiation is not absorbed within this layer, and so atmospheric temperature again begins to decline with increasing altitude. So here nothing is being absorbed anymore, so as we go up, temperature starts to decline once again. The temperature of the mesosphere reaches a minimum of about 103 degrees Fahrenheit, below zero, uh, negative 103, at an altitude of about 50 miles. The coldest temperatures anywhere in the atmosphere occur at the mesopause, which is the layer at the top of the mesosphere. Because accessibility is difficult, the mesosphere is one of the least explored regions of the atmosphere. It cannot be reached by the highest research balloons, nor is it accessible to the lowest orbiting satellites. Recent technology developments are just beginning to fill this gap of knowledge. This brings us to the last layer that we will focus on, which is the thermosphere. The fourth layer extends outward from the mesosphere, uh, mesopause and has no well-defined upper limit. It is the thermosphere, a layer that contains only a tiny fraction of the Earth's atmosphere's mass. In the extremely rarefied air in this outermost layer, temperatures again increase due to absorption of the very high-energy solar radiation by atoms in, of oxygen and nitrogen. Temperatures rise to extremely high levels of more than 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit in this thermosphere. But, such, such temperatures are not comparable to those experienced on Earth's surface. Temperature is defined in, in terms of the average speed at which molecules move. Because the gases in the thermosphere are moving at very high speeds, the temperature is very high. But... The gases are so sparse that collectively they possess only an insignificant quantity of heat. For this reason, the temperature of a satellite orbiting Earth in the thermosphere is determined chiefly by the amount of solar radiation it's absorbing, and not by the high temperature of the almost non-existent surrounding air. If an astronaut inside were exposed to his or her uh, hand, the atmosphere would not feel hot. This minimum temperature uh, marks the bottom of the atmosphere's thinnest layer and uppermost layer, uh, the thermosphere. Um, so that's at the pause here. So again, we start from a minimum temperature and actually go up to a maximum. And this is because it's heated by x-rays that are now coming in. Nearly all gases are good x-ray absorbers. So x-rays from the sun are absorbed by the very first gases that they encounter with the atmosphere. Being the uppermost layer of the atmosphere, most x-rays are absorbed here in the thermosphere. The absorbed energy makes temperatures quite high, um, so thermos mean, is Greek for hot, so it makes sense. Um, so virtually no x-rays penetrate beneath this layer, which is why x-ray telescopes are useful only uh, on very high-flying balloons, rockets, and or spacecraft. Note that there is a fourth layer, but we won't go into that, the exosphere. Alright, so let's go ahead and take a look at some questions. So pause your lecture every time we get to a new question, think of an answer, and then uh, restart it once you have one. Question one, the main difference between weather and climate is what? The answer here is B. Weather is the daily variation that actually occurs at a location where climate is the general pattern of weather over time. Number two. What makes up the largest proportion by volume of clean and dry air? So what gas is most abundant? The answer here is A, nitrogen. Nitrogen followed by oxygen together make up 99% of all air in our atmosphere. Number three, which of the following uh, protects us from harmful UV radiation from the sun? All right, so that would be the ozone layer. B, 
Uh, let's see. I think we have one more. Yep. So here, uh, the middle light blue layer is known as what? So that would be the one where the meteor is. Well, here we're seeing a huge decrease in temperature. This is the mesosphere. It's the home to the coldest temperatures anywhere in our atmosphere. All right, so that's it for our first atmospheric lesson. We're going to go into a few more. Uh, we're going to look at lots of things like how the atmosphere is actually heated. Uh, we're going to look at moisture and storms and things like that before we get into astronomy down the road. So as always, thanks for watching and have a great day.